Amalia did it. <laughs> great. Thanks, Amalia. Okay, great. So we are ready to get started with this month's um, InterReach webinar. So we've got three speakers today and two are synchronously with us and one is um, asynchronously with us. So the first um, is Gabrielle Bammer. She is the professor of integration and implementation sciences at the Australian National University. In addition to developing integration and implementation sciences, I2S, as a discipline to support various approaches to tackling, to tackling complex societal and environmental problems, she curates the popular Integration and Implementation Insights blog and repository, which, is, which can be found at i2sinsights.org. Um, and so she will be joining us um, asynchronously. And then our other two speakers are Dr. Bethany K. Larson, um, who is an integration and implementation studies specialist or an I2S specialist who focuses on tools that aid cross-disciplinary integration. She is a team science specialist at the University of Michigan and principal consultant at Larson Evaluation and Design, LLC. And then finally, our very own Christine Hendren, who serves as the um, Interim Vice Provost for Research and Innovation, the Director of the Research Institute for Environment, Energy and Economics, and Professor in the Department of Geological and Environmental Sciences at Appalachian State University in Boone, North Carolina. In those roles, she builds transdisciplinary research capacity in multi-sector teams to address complex global sustainability challenges, um, she founded and co-chairs InterReach, um, this group, and um, which we all know is a community of practice for research professionals whose expertise is integrating across boundaries. So great. We've got our two speakers here, but to start us off, I am going to be playing a video from Gabrielle Bammer, um, and we are going to... Sounds great. Um, we are going to go ahead and watch that here. So let me go ahead and share my screen and share sound. And if you guys, I've got the chat up. So if you can't see or hear the video, please put something in the chat real quick. We'll get started. Okay, here we go with um, Dr. Gabrielle Bammer's presentation. Hello, I'm sorry I can't be online with you, but I'm really not at my best at two in the morning. Nevertheless, it's great to have this opportunity to talk to you about um, being the arrow and how integration and implementation sciences is one option for doing that. So you might recall this image that Christine put up last month when she talked about this series. And I'm going to be concentrating on this particular piece of this image. So what would it look like for emerging integration professions to be disciplinary experts? I'm going to give you a very brief history and uh, the commonalities from when integration and implementation was first developed to the current third version that I'm working on now. I'm then going to go through the framework and the associated expertise in a little bit more detail. And I'm going to finish by talking about how I envisage being the arrow would work. The starting point for me was really in the 1990s when I had the opportunity to re lead a great project on whether or not we should prescribe heroin to dependent heroin users. And I had the opportunity to do that in a way that I thought it should be done, which was to bring in multiple disciplines, to work with all the stakeholders, police, drug users, service providers, and also to work closely with the political process. Um, so working with government about how this could be implemented. Um, in case you're wondering, it was implemented for a total of 18 days before the Prime Minister said, no, we're not doing this. Um, and then I spent some time thinking about what could we have done better. What we did was all very intuitive. There were no uh, real tools that we had at our disposal to bring to play. And I was curious about what we could have done if we'd known about it. 
So in 2000, I had the opportunity to attend a whole range of conferences on systems thinking, interdisciplinarity, action research. Transdisciplinarity wasn't much of a thing at that time. It certainly didn't have any conferences. Did a lot of reading, talked to a lot of people and discovered that yes, indeed, there was a lot out there that we could have used if we'd known about it. Lots of theory and methods, but it was also hard to find and highly fragmented. And the other thing that was really striking was that the communities were very small. So the Systems Thinking Conference, which was an international conference, only had a few hundred people at it. And that was typical for all the conferences. Not only were they small, but they didn't talk to each other. And I was comparing it also with discipline-based conferences that I'd been to before, which had thousands or tens of thousands of people at them, and now even more so. And everything that happened subsequent to that really pivotal year was reinforced those lessons for me. So in 2002, I set up the first website and in 2005 published the first paper, um, the first iteration of I2S, so I2S 1.0. And this was a paper in the journal Ecology and Society. In 2013, I published a book uh, or called Disciplining Interdisciplinarity. And 10 years later now, I'm working on a third version of thinking about I2S. You obviously can't read this image, but, but this, is, this is I2S in, in a single image. And I'm going to talk about bits of this now. Not now, shortly. <laughs> First, I'm going to talk about what stayed the same. So what stayed the same across these three approaches is a focus on connecting these disparate communities. The communities are represented here in this word cloud. Um, and the point is that they've all got things to offer to people tackling complex societal and, envir and environmental problems, which is the focus of, of the work that I'm doing. Um, but none of them cover all of it. Um, and there's a lot that, that they could learn from each other. It's important not only for those scholarly reasons, but also for political reasons. Because these communities are so small, they really don't have any political influence. And so I've always been thinking about how do we improve the scholarly work, but also how do we improve the political influence? The other thing that stayed the same is this idea of building a cross-cutting repository of knowledge. And here I mean concepts, methods and other tools that are useful for tackling complex societal and environmental problems. The first website was, as I said, uh, developed in 2002. This is the Integration and Implementation Sciences website, which had a resources repository, which we've just dismantled because it's really been taken over by Integration and Implementation Insights, which is a blog and repository, which started oh. in 2015. So they worked together for a while and now one's taken over. Um, I hope you all know about this blog. I hope um, that you will contribute to it if you haven't already. I know that Bethany and the two Christines have made terrific contributions. And if I could tell who was in the audience, I could give a shout out probably to some others of you. But really, this is a, a repository that really tries to both build community and capitalise on the community's knowledge and resources. So please contribute. So in a nutshell, the new framework looks like this. Um, it's got three areas uh, which are in the top bar and then 12, 11, sorry, um, 11 major topics that it deals with. So let me deal with these in more detail one by one. So the first area is that we need to understand problems and potential actions more comprehensively. And to do that, we need to do five things. So the first is we need to look at the problems and the actions as systems. That means we need to attend to the dynamic webs of relationships. We need to understand that we can never deal with a whole system. We always have to set boundaries. We need to be able to look down at the, the small. We need to look back up at the whole. Um, and we need to be able to take different perspectives, uh, which is a, a key piece that appears at several points. We need to understand the importance of context, and that's important in three ways. So not only big picture context, so what's the history, the geography, the cultural aspects, the economics, what are the, what's the political context in which we're operating, and what does that make possible, and what does it stop, shut down? 
We also need to understand the context of the organisations that we work in and the organisations that we work with. So their structure and culture and what do they make possible and what do they shut down. And then we need to understand our individual context, our own individual context or positionality. So what is, what is our experience um, and um, for our position in society, what does that make possible and what does it shut down? We also need to be able to deal with what we don't know. It's really risky to put it to one side because that's where all the adverse unintended consequences and nasty surprises come from. So we need better ways of dealing with the unknown. We need to be able to manage or bring to the table, sorry, we need to be able to bring to the table diversity. And that's not just differences in gender identity and age and ability, but it's also different worldviews, different values, different interests, different understandings of what makes for good science. Um, and it's not enough to just bring that all to the table, but we also need to be able to develop an integrated view. So how do we pull together um, these different perspectives, these different ways of looking at to get this richer picture and this richer set of possibilities for action. We also need to understand that some things cannot be brought together and what do we do with those. The second bit of the framework is to be able to support policy and practice improvement, which happens by government, by business, by civil society. As researchers, we're generally not in a position to make improvements on complex problems, but we can work closely with those who do make those improvements. And that's got three dimensions as well and three areas where we need to develop expertise. The first is in decision making. So before we can do anything, decisions have to be made. And so we need to be able to help governments and business and civil society make better decisions. We need to help them understand how to make rational um, well thought through decisions on the complex aspects of problems and how to take into account the biases and heuristics that most of the short term decision making that we make in, in almost all of our lives, um, how to take that into account so that it doesn't wreck um, the important decisions that have to be made. The second piece is through search implementation, which is how do we um, get better evidence and get good evidence better into policy and practice? How do we have the policy and practice to be informed and hopefully even based on evidence? And finally, how do we bring about a good understanding of change, not only in our own communities, so that as researchers, we're not um, simple minded about change happens. It's not just a matter of telling policymakers what they need to do. And it's not just a matter of policymakers telling the community what they need to do. Change is this wonderful dance that happens in society. Things are changing all the time and you've got to get in there and um, you've got to be very canny in order to be able to make improvements happen, especially when there are countervailing forces. And so we have an obligation as researchers to understand what those processes are and to help people make be able to affect change more effectively. The third is that to do all that, we need to be able to interact effectively. So we need to be able to work effectively in teams. So we need to be able to manage collaborations. We need to be able to uh, build trust, build a shared vision and um, all those things that are important for working together. We need to be able to manage our disagreements. We need to be able to engage with stakeholders effectively. Sometimes we'll be co-producing with stakeholders and they'll be in the team, but a lot of the time that's not possible. So how do we work with, what are other options for working with stakeholders and how do we do the best that we can in the circumstances that we have? And how do we repay stakeholders for the effort of being involved in the research? Uh, so what are the obligations we have to them? And finally, um, in both of these and in everything else that we do, good communication is the key. So how do, how do we learn to explain clearly, to listen actively, and um, to really be able to communicate well? So let me finish by talk, talking about how I envisage being the arrow works. 
the analogy I like to use is the discipline of statistics. Um, sometimes people get confused and think I'm talking about um, I2S as statistics. No, I'm not. But they're two disciplines that have a lot in common. And I think in making I2S work, we can learn quite a lot from statistics. So the first is that each of them has a specific skill set that it brings to teams and each of them evolves through practical collaboration. So they don't involve in la la land, if you like, they evolve by getting their hands dirty with specific problems. Um, the thing that we can really learn from statistics is the dedicated journals. So if a statistician working on a health problem develops a new statistical method, they can publish it in a statistics journal where it can be picked up by other statisticians working on environment or education or some other area. Um, and it's then really easy to disseminate statistical knowledge we don't have that and we really need to have it. So if someone working on a sustainability issue develops a new way of working in a team or a new integration method, they tend to publish it in the sustainability journal where it's then really hard for anybody else working in any other problem, a complex health problem, for example, to find. And we need dedicated journals that will focus on I2S. The other thing that statistics has done really well is that it's made sure that the teams who need statistical help know how to use it well. And we need to do the same for I2S. So that once upon a time, you used to bring a statistician in at the end of the project and say, here's some data, fix it for us, figure it out, figure out what we found. And the statisticians got pretty fed up with that and said, look, you've really got to bring us in at the beginning. You've got to help us, let us help you design the research. Um, and we need to do the same. A lot of um, the work that's done on complex societal and environmental problems is done fairly intuitively. People don't think that they need expertise until they run into problems. And so we've got to say, look, guys, you need us on the team from the beginning. We can help you design the, the study more effectively. We can help you think about who needs to be at the table. We can help you manage um, the interactions with those people, etc., etc. So as you will have seen from the expertise that I've laid out or from the elements of the framework, it's big. Um, and you don't need to have all that expertise yourself. But what you do need to know is you need to know the importance of the framework and you do need to know good people that you can call on. So if you're really good at change but not good at the unknown, you need to know people who, are, who think a lot about the unknown, who could be brought in um, into the project to help it with those particular aspects. Of course, there aren't enough trained people are available at the moment. That's another problem. But this is this is what I'm arguing that we need training for. Right. So, what I've tried to do is to give you a taste of what it means to be the arrow. And um, uh, if the arrow was an established academic field, it obviously can't happen unless others are interested and get involved. One person can't develop a discipline. I'm really looking forward to the recording and hearing what Christine and Bethany have to say, along with hearing uh, the discussion and uh, hopefully being able to see the chat. And I'm really happy to be contacted and have follow up conversations with anyone that's interested. On this slide, uh, you can find information and the slides will be available, information about uh, the websites, um, other uh, social media that we use. And uh, at the bottom, most importantly, my email address. So um, as I said, we re would really love to hear from you. And I hope you have a great session. Right. Thanks, Gabrielle. It's 2 a.m. for you and hopefully you're sleeping well, but thank you very much for that. Um, great, I think we're ready to move on to our next speaker. And um, um, let's go ahead and, you know, Obviously, Bethany's or um, Gabrielle's not here to answer any questions, but hopefully we can get some um, discussion going after Bethany and Christine's uh, talk. So, Bethany, do you want to take us away? Oh, Christine, Bethany had um, asked to maybe go second. Uh, oh, after so. okay, second after you, so third. <laughs> yes. See, perfect. We're we're demonstrating <laughs> the the necessity of a shared language. This is. <laughs> One of the reasons that I2S exists, right? So, 
Bethany, confirming, you meant second out of the two of us live presenters? Indeed, Christine, after you. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> thank you. Um, well, thank you, Christine um, and Amalia for getting us uh, going. And thank you, Gabrielle. Um, no one here on this call is jealous that I have to follow Gabrielle. Uh, I really always enjoy learning from her. And so what a treat. Um, Y'all are seeing the correct big screen, right? Okay, I'm in a new office uh, and I'm, I'm not good at it yet. I'll pretend that one day I will be. Um, but it is really lovely to share right now kind of one person's story following on a lot of the things that Gabrielle shared about creating the I2S name and making it possible for people to claim it and, and roll it into their lives. So. This is, I called it one person's story of arrowing their way into an I2S pathway because the I2S pathway is for a faculty member, but I arrowed until I ended up as a faculty member. I My story wasn't um, being a faculty member and then kind of moving into the arrow work. So you can come at this from all the directions, um, but that was kind of mine. Um, and so I'll just give a few reflections. I think um, one, I think I will. Um, one of the things that Gabrielle is so uh, good at that has helped me and been a gift as I found a kind of how to arrow was making the invisible visible in a really succinct and insistent and rigorous way um, where it, it feels like it has made sense all along, but she just makes it visible and articulates well the that process of identifying the pieces of the labor, the tactical, um, intellectual, and emotional pieces of the labor to allow people to value this work both within themselves and also within teams that need it. Um, and so I've tried to uh, go along on that ride and, and learn from that um, and all the other people, many of whom are on this call that kind of feel that truth and, and know that this is where we add value. So um, my reflections on, I watched her video three times because I was hanging on all the different words and um, her distillation, um, but I was struck by this similar uh, origin story um, later in time uh, to Gabrielle of being in a, a place where I was noticing boundary spanning that was critical to our shared mission of a large project. Um, then recognizing that we had done it intuitively and, and kind of noting that certainly there was a way to do it better and on purpose and then seeking out intention. Um, in doing that, then finding, oh, there are people doing this all over. I didn't immerse myself in as broad a set of conferences as Gabrielle um, mentioned, I took a screenshot of all those different disciplines that she talked about in her 90s journey. Um, but I found myself in the science of team science um, and then found a lot of the folks here at where we started meeting as interreach. So similarly, I turned kind of to focus more on researching methods or practicing methods rather um, and coalescing knowledge for these people trying to solve complex problems. Um, then I put this third step of calibrating the gut. So I would call this a long season of side quests um, mm -hmm. and own goals, meaning, you know, doing career choices that would seem to be counterproductive to advancing if what I was trying to do is get any stable position or become a tenure track faculty member or do something that made sense. Um, and then flock finding. So this is a lot of that flock, but finding other people that say, no, this is real work and this is what you want to do. So find ways to keep doing it. Um, the the long season of side quests is partly because uh, because it's not yet a established discipline and, and some of the gaps exist that Gabrielle shared about a journal, um, a department you could hire into. Um, you have to, or at least at my story was that I had to build credibility and trade in the economies of people that already existed. So I had to earn respect on understood terms in understood um, kind of value systems. So there's this delta between what the people that I was working with could measure in terms of uh, success metrics and what I was feeling that my real value was in doing so many of these parts of the I2S 3.0 that um, that Gabrielle talks about with these well-articulated skill sets. So kind of had to do both and it would be great if people don't have to do that, but it does give you this domain specificity that you can kind of trade in to, 
to bring people in. Um, and then after this long season, I feel like I have been very lucky to see a gradation of successes in um, bringing I2S into projects further and further upstream. So Saint was kind of this, the, my first um, center where I noticed this work happening and that was the light bulb moment. And then I'll tell briefly about uh, three projects. I won't go too much into detail, but um, where there was a proof of concept project, um, then steps is um, sort of this blank canvas moment where the my colleagues invited me in to help us use I2S as a scaffolding for the center. And then um, the research institute where I have been for the past three years, um, as uh, was a chance and continues to be to um, institutionalize and in, into a university some of these I2S skills um, and values. So all I was going to say about Saint is that it was similarly to the the um, heroin multi stakeholder project that Gabrielle mentioned. It was a complex uh, challenge for us to acknowledge that the novel properties of nanomaterials in the early 2000s were known to enable a lot of great things, but we wanted to also break the cycle of unintended consequences because those same properties might cause unintended collateral damages. And we didn't even know how to measure them, how to you know forecast what was going on. It required many, many different people from different disciplines. So in looking at the nanomaterial environment, health and safety world, we sort of needed to combine all these different ideas and filter them across fields, synthesize them and create risk forecasts and figure out the next best questions to address when we were just, um, you know, we had some really good leadership and insight, but we were, what I now see is muddling through the shared language, um, not really understanding that we needed to explicitly create shared um, boundary objects to help navigate these um, and realize that it was not only individuals integrating, but whole disciplines learning from each other and that many barriers could have been avoided by recognizing different epistemologies, working to a shared vision. So that sort of light bulb moment um, between these entire you know ways that people think um, made me see that integration happens across so many boundaries and that it doesn't just magically happen, right? Which we all know here. So um, there are, are many different ones, institutional, geographies, sectors, disciplines, all this. So then I had the moment that Gabrielle was talking about and saying, okay, uh, there are different communities out there. And the Science of Team Science was the one that I found. Gabrielle's book, um, through the Science of Team Science, I found her disciplining interdisciplinarity um, and realized together with a lot of folks in this community, like, oh, the boxes don't just connect. Someone has to be the arrow. Um, and I won't go into too much of that because we've introduced the, the story of interreach many times. Um, so we have this dual mission together here of developing the profession and professional development. I did think it was kind of interesting in seeing Gabrielle's that um, she put her website up in 2002 and then published her first publication in 2005. And there was also three years between putting the interreach website up and um, my first team science uh, aero related publication, which was one of the chapters in this strategies for team science success. So I had always felt really bad about that lag and now Gabrielle makes me feel, okay, if, if it's okay for her, these things can take time. Um, there were just some projects. Uh, this is a moment when realizing some things that we were working on in a group that there were significant blind spots between understanding um, inner kingdom communication between different types of cells. Um, via extracellular vesicles. Those words are not important. It's just that biologists and engineers could already answer each other's questions that they had not known how to even formulate. We realized this and I went ahead and um, submitted something to the NSF, not claiming um, environmental engineering as my discipline, but claiming I2S as my discipline. And I thought, okay, they will either hate this or like it, but it's what I'm proposing to do. So let's see what happens. Um, and so we put at the very middle, me as the PI, the PI of a science project where I was not proposing to do any of the, you know, the science, the, the research, but I was gonna do the integration science. And, um, and we won, it was really cool. Uh, largely because of the prowess of a lot of my colleagues and going all in and trusting this. Um, and it was really neat to see. Um, I'm gonna skip the next slide. It's just 
history. Um, and then I'm going to talk about the next example where, okay, so convergence worked in the vesicle project and assess said, yes, we got, uh, we had three PIs and three postdocs, well, originally students, and they went through a whole cohort and it was great. Um, there's this, um, current um, phosphorus project that's a science and technology center, um, which is really interesting. It is a giant team of, you know, 150 people, nine universities, soon to be 10. And what we did was um, start off, my colleagues who are the director and deputy directors invited me to kind of the center of the planning and said, we're going to go all in on convergence. So their idea was, you know, to call STEPS, which is about phosphorus sustainability, a convergence research center with phosphorus sustainability as the vehicle. And what we really did was structure the entire center around this opportunity to draw on our team science um, and transdisciplinary research and practice tools to both like drive the structure um, and the process design, but also um, form the scaffolding of some research possibilities. Um, so we have both tools that we use in that center and individual habits of mind um, that we've talked about in, in some of this webinar series before where even the material scientists use epistemic humility, interdependence and co-creation of knowledge in their work. We talk about boundary objects explicitly. So this is, um, I'll go through this to not take up too much time, but these are you know objects that connect us across divides and boundaries in order to co-create knowledge. And everyone in the center uses these and refers to them explicitly in their use. So we, for example, have been talking about this one diagram and it's myriad imperfections as a way to work together for years. And it's nice to see it baked in. Um, and then finally, the um, Research Institute for Environment, Energy and Economics, the um, the managing director of which is here with us, I think, Grace Plummer, um, is institutionalizing I2S in the way that it operates. Um, so that is really fun to see. This is um, what we do is connect, support, and amplify research on sustainability throughout Appalachian State. So seeing how that is to then create capacity in a faculty is great. Um, remaining challenges scaling. So uh, there's no training to find others and, and pass it on effic efficiently so that if other people wanna do this, it would be great to be like, yes, so we have some wonderful postdocs in our center and hopefully we pass that on to them. Um, delivering both scholarly products and scaffolding at the same time is really tough. Identifying appropriate success metrics um, that don't allow the credit to just fall to one person's name, but really a capacity broadly that can be tough. And then choosing what to do is always uh, my worst skill. So, cause I just wanna say yes to everything. So that's enough for me. And um, thank you, Gabrielle. And thank you everyone for giving me a chance to reflect. Thanks, Christine. Um, uh, Bethany, let's, um, let's move on to your talk and then we can um, open it up for discussion after your, after your wonderful talk. All right, excellent. I invite folks to go ahead and capture your thoughts from the previous two presentations and drop them in the chat now if you feel like you just want to capture that um, and we'll come back to it. Um, I am going to lean into the, the friendly, helpful community that is into reach, be a little vulnerable today and share with you my story as an early career scholar and practitioner of I2S and in fact, ask for your feedback and input as I've just embarked on my newest chapter of my journey joining the University of Michigan as a team science specialist just three weeks ago. So I'm still learning how to talk about this, be this, communicate this in um, outwardly, inwardly, and, and of course, interdependently with all of you. So um, as speaking of boundary objects, <laughs> as a focal point, I would like to offer a brief tour of my website actually as a way of talking about and showing how I think about my identity as an I2S specialist. And um, again, being vulnerable here, I think that um, my website probably needs some work. And so please, if you have some ideas about like 
how can I2S be clearer um, in my particular version of I2S in my website? Um, what questions, and then like what generally, what questions does it raise for you about I2S and, and what other career pathways are available? Any and all of that open for discussion today. So I'll share my screen um, and there is no sound, so we can just jump right over there. Um, so my website is just bethanylarson.com, which is, you know, using your own name as a domain is a common practice in um, scholarship academia or in like freelance work or other sort of individually oriented professions. And um, I made that choice a long time ago realizing that my particular occupation, how it's labeled and how I describe myself to others might change, but my name probably wouldn't change. <laughs> so I um, made that strategic decision. And then I can change what's on the website much more easily. As Christine mentioned, and as Gabrielle has, has mentioned in her talk and elsewhere, um, to as a, a friend and colleague of mine has said, Hazel Simonette, to speak into people's listening. Um, and the people that I have been wanting to listen to, have listened to me, have changed uh, as I've moved through life. So, um, but for the last several years, I have been explicitly claiming the title of an integration and implementation specialist um, because mainly my Eureka moment was Gabrielle's 2013 book. I resonated a lot with um, both the scholarly and political aims of I2S development as a discipline. Um, and some of that you can then see here in my website under the about, right, which is where you would go to learn more of what, what do I mean by being an I2S implementation specialist. And I open here with the thought that Bethany gets things done. Um, it's something that has been reflected back to me about how I operate. And it's what, something that resonated with me about Gabrielle's vision for I2S and that it is a problem oriented field that seeks to apply what we know uh, in increasingly comprehensive and efficient and intelligent ways. Um, I've also resonated with the scholarly and political aims of I2S in both, both the the knowledge um under you know that first aim she talked about in i2s 3.0 of understanding problems and solutions more comprehensively and then as well as the change and interacting more effectively pieces which is more practice oriented and so i've always introduced and had said sessions on my website that are about scholarship as well as practicing whether that's consulting or teaching and again, even though I don't do teaching per se anymore as a team science specialist at the University of Michigan, I will be doing some training um, and still teaching, again, has currency in academia. You'll know what that is. People can kind of recognize that. But then how I describe myself in each of those is um, in my little flavors of I2S. Another aspect of I2S that I appreciated from what Gabrielle envisioned is that you don't have to know everything about I2S to be an I2S specialist. I really resonate with the integration portion of the integration and implementation sciences vision. Um, it's um, something that just gets my juices flowing in the morning is some of my heart passion developing some of those more integrated understandings of the world and of, of how we can live in it wisely. Um, so I've tried my best throughout my website to put that forward as a thing that I know. I have a degree, for instance, in community sustainability in, from Michigan State, and many of my colleagues in that department are actually specialists in the stakeholder engagement side of I2S. And so that's not something, ironically, that I claim as one of my <laughs> expertise, but I know enough about it to know that those are the people that I need to go um, to go and 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 coordinate with when I'm joining on projects. So 
I'll jump over to the consulting side because I think that one is a little bit clearer about how I weave the practice and the scholarship together in multiple modes. Um, I do have an official LLC, which again, <laughs> thinking in Gabrielle's way about claiming political and um, you know institutional influence, um, it helps to have an LLC. I'm just a single member LLC. LLC, I don't, it's very simple. I highly recommend if you do any kind of consulting work or project work, $25 a year approximately to claim your LLC, get some help with some articles of organization. It's like one or two pages and it has dramatically helped to underwrite um, my expertise as a, an I2S specialist. Um, and again, focusing on solving problems here, and then differentiating like statisticians do in the domains of work where I apply my I2S work as well as the modes of work in, in which I do that. So, you know, I have background in natural resources, governance, team science, community sustainability and information design. So those are the topic areas. And when I work in those topic areas, I can do research, I can facilitate, I can do evaluation, I can do tra training. All of those things, this is again, another thing I appreciate about I2S is that all of that is welcome in the I2S world. Um, I'll just quickly hop over to research. Um, teaching is not as relevant right now, so I'm just gonna skip that. You're welcome to, to take a look at it later. Um, and, Research, I just decided to try to be comprehensive because one of the goals of my website is not only to um, establish and claim legitimacy for myself as an I2S specialist, but also to share resources that I have developed in my work. Um, so I listed a bunch of them here. Um, this is one of several different ways I've tried over the years to do this. I, I welcome your suggestions. Um, and this little call out here, you know, calls out some of the newest things. But the most important things, of course, I keep on the home page. Um, and that's, in fact, where I see most of my statistics, right? Like people just land on my home page, see the, see the gist, and then um, bounce from there. So that's all I have for now. Um, I welcome your thoughts about, like, what, what questions does this raise for you about being an early career I2S specialist? Where do you see in particular have, you can ask me like, have you thought about X, Y, Z? Um, how has this worked for you? So I'll open it up for discussion and questions now, thanks. Thank you, Bethany and Christine. I think Amalia, I think you were gonna facilitate the that question and answer. Do you want to? Right. We have about nine minutes left total, but um, I just want to say thank you to Gabrielle and Christine and Bethany for all of this, your amazing perspective on um, being the arrow and claiming this title of I2S specialist. So um, if there are any questions from the group, I think, um, uh, all right. So we, we have um, one in the chat. Um, from Mike, how has the public responded to your website and LLC status? So I, I'm, that's for Bethany. Yeah, um, the LLC has really come in handy. Um, it, it's quite easy, like it's, an, it's a very recognizable container for folks for engaging me in a consulting kind of collaboration. Um, it makes it much easier for people to like refer others to me um, and say like, this is what she does. So that has been helpful. Um, I actually don't think that my website seems to have gotten much traction. I know that it gets some hits, you know, when I apply for jobs or when I give a talk or, or something, I see a little spike in some activity, but um, overall I'm not, a, you know, a web <laughs> um, aficionado and, um, haven't haven't been able to track the real effectiveness of the website so far. And Bethany, there's a suggestion for you in the in the chat if you want to take a look at that. Um, does anyone else have any any questions? Oh, Kenan, go ahead. Yeah, thanks. Um, just a question about time and utilization of time for both of you. 
Um, in my experience, uh, academia in particular tends to use a lot of its constituents' time around various items that aren't necessarily useful for deep integration. And they, what I think is probably in both of your instances, you have deep integration in very specific projects. But what can you say about the use of your time by departments and by others? Um, I can say that I am my own worst time enemy, I think. So I, um, but I do think that it has been really interesting to, I feel like I've been a little bit slow to take the stage in some senses of like, oh, it's actually, I am, I have a leadership role in some sense in certain arenas and it's to me to make a change structurally to how we use our time. So I think slowly I've been looking for ways to onboard that and to, um, you know, I find people are really hungry for capacity building in efficiency. So, you know, something as simple as using the slides to have people put post-it notes rather than go around one, one by one updating, um, introducing those sort of modes of, of creativity and play if possible into work. Um, so I am, always trying to find ways to do better in that regard. Um, but I have found almost universal uptake in improvements wherever I think of trying to introduce them. I think Christine's success is a, is a product of her wonderful sparkling personality. And maybe I have some sharper edges or maybe just landed in less fertile um, soil at times I have run into a bit of pigeonholing or um, resistance to the expertise that I do have. Um, and of course, like we can share stories all day long about that, but it, I, I have felt like a lot of times my expertise has not been fully tapped. Um, like the vision for it has been really small, um, but I'm looking, I, I think that that is going to change with my new position at, at Mishar. So I'm very excited to be here. Thank you. Uh, Chris, you have a question. Uh, yes, thanks so much. Thanks really to everybody. I have lots of questions and I am currently tapping Bethany's expertise uh, and we'll be back in uh, touch uh, regarding that. We've already started a, a collaboration. But my question right now is for uh, Christine. I was really struck by um, the visual for the, the RAISE project, which was a way then to answer a grant as a PI that's doing integration specifically. And I don't know if you could say more about um, how really the, the NSF received that. I mean, you were funded, I got that, but are they, did they kind of seize upon it as, wow, this is like a, a new way that we should support and can we work together? about indicators for making that work and evaluating that afterwards to see how it went. And it just seems like super, a super strong way to, to do a project. And, you know, is there gonna be some kind of follow-up on the method is my question. Um, thank you so much for that. Um, I, we just wrapped up and I just kind of sent out the final uh, poll. So we had RB on ourselves. Um, and I think it's going to end up being, I mean, I'm wildly out of my disciplinary knowledge to be saying in ethnography, but I'm just going to publish what we found out and um, invite, you know, harsh social scientist reviewers. Um, and, you know, I think they were very happy to be experimental. They didn't have a lot of holding our feet to the fire as far as what they expected to come out of it. Um, and it was a really nice, long, slow burn. Like there's kind of some new expertise that exists in the world that I, I don't know why I'm saying kind of like that would not have other than that. And it took the full three and a half years to be able to see what that was. So um, I hope there, I plan for there to be a paper that comes out of it. Um, but yes, I'm happy to also share that proposal and the pieces of that um, for other people to see what worked. I would love that for one, personally. Great, thank you, Christine. Well, 
I think that um, being two minutes uh, to the hour, we should uh, probably wrap it up now. But um, thank you everyone for joining us for our first kind of um, perspective installment of this series. And um, please join us um, next month. The details aren't up yet, um, but once we get the title of, of, of the next one finalized, we do have our presenters in line, um, then we'll post it up on the website and um, there we're constantly updating the, the InterReach website. And if you have more thoughts about this, more discussion questions, then um, please feel free to engage on the, the InterReach listserv um, and uh, share your thoughts there. All right, thank you so much everyone for coming. And again, thank you to our, our speakers and panelists here. We'll uh, see you um, next month. And again, if you want to propose something for what used to be the Reading and Discussion Club, uh, we invite you to do that as well. Thanks everyone, take care. Bye. Bye. Bye.